We are living through a golden age of Mars exploration, with three new missions having reached the red planet in 2021 alone. But what is it about Mars that fascinates us as a species? And why do we concentrate so many of our exploratory missions on its surface and its atmosphere? This episode, I got the chance to speak to planetary scientist and space communicator Emily Lakdawalla to pick her brains about Martian exploration, the complexities of red planet rovers, and the search for signs of life in the solar system. So my name is Emily Lakdawalla. I'm a planetary scientist, a science journalist, and uh a space artist from time to time. I've written a lot of articles uh, for magazines and websites about the exploration of our solar system and one book titled The Design and Engineering of Curiosity about the engineering of the Curiosity rover. I'm working on a second book right now about the science mission. Cool, yeah. I mean, you know, you're known um, within the sort of space and uh, astronomy community around the world, I guess, as as an expert and, 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 a, and a sort of... Uh, a fan and fountain of knowledge and all things planetary science. I, I was just wondering to uh, be worth sort of kicking off. Um, how, how did you first become interested in, interested in, in, in uh, planetary science, and when did you sort of realize that that was your that was your thing that you know that was, that was the thing you 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 were drawn to? Well, I've always been a science. I was always a science kid growing up. I used to love watching the public television shows about. Uh, whether it was space or dinosaurs or geology or physics or whatever, all of those topics, uh, they all fascinated me pretty equally. I think that my family had gotten one of those series of books that you can subscribe to that had uh, one on the solar system that was published just after the Voyager encounters with Jupiter and Saturn. I do remember looking as a as a little kid at these photos of these moons that nobody had seen before, and they all had these wonderful names like Io and Europa and Ganymede and Callisto and Mimas Enceladus, Tethys, Dione, Rhea, <laughs> Titan, Hyperion, Iapetus, Phoebe. <laughs> They're all all these fabulous names from uh, you know mythology, and they just they were all these worlds instead of little points of light. So I think I was predisposed to like space, but it wasn't until after I'd completed college with a geology degree and was teaching science to nine and ten year olds um, in a in a small private school that. Uh, it occurred to me that you could possibly do geology on other worlds. And so I went to study that in graduate school. And I think I I, mo- I had the hope that I would work maybe for a museum or uh, maybe do research for television shows or something. And I lucked into the job that I had at the Planetary Society, where I got to make a career out of explaining the exploration of our solar system, both the engineering and the science and the adventure. Um, and uh, as of last year, I'm now freelance. I'm uh, just doing pursuing my own uh, book and article projects and writing books and having a good time with that while I'm able to hang out with my kids at home. Do, do you think we're sort of, um, relatively speaking, living in a a golden age of, of planetary exploration? It, it does seem like, the, if you look at the sort of last two decades, the, the amount of, of uh, missions that have been launched to, the, to planetary bodies uh, across the solar system is, is, is spectacular, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. This really is the best time to be alive in terms of planetary exploration. There are so many missions going to so many places. There was a real low time around the 1980s, which was actually the time that the Planetary Society was founded for that reason, because people had been so excited and inspired by both the Voyager missions to Jupiter and Saturn and the Viking missions to Mars, the orbiters and the landers. And it felt like we had just begun this exploration of the solar system and NASA was ready to shut things down. Um, Fortunately, that course was reversed in about the late 1990s. Um, we began with what I regard as the as the second great age of, of solar system exploration, starting with several missions to Mars, and um, it was actually led off by this fabulous mission to Venus called uh, Magellan. And then we launched Cassini towards Saturn. We had Galileo approaching Jupiter. We had Hubble had its vision fixed, and were able to see um, all the bodies in our solar system in beautiful color, and um, and just. But, stacks of missions to Mars and little tiny missions flying past asteroids and finding out how diverse they were. And it's just been a wonderful time to see new worlds. Yeah, I mean, uh, Mars certainly seems to be the sort of um, plant, planet du jour, I guess you might say. Um, c- certainly in, in 2021, we've had three three new missions landing and uh, arriving at the planet. Recently, we've had the, um, as we're recording, we've had the uh, first um, images from the China's uh, Chan Wen probe and the uh, Zhurong um, uh, rover 
what does it mean, do you think, for for China to be putting its its first sort of uh, robotic feelers on on Mars? Well, I think that anytime you have uh, more uh, different uh, nations ex- exploring out into space, it really helps a lot for the scientific community because space is really big. <laughs> There's a lot of it out there. Um, people want to make it into a, this big competition. And to be sure, there is um, there is competition in terms of political standing and on the global stage. But when it comes to the science and the opportunities presented by exploring the solar system, um, it actually is very helpful to have more different agencies out there because um, they'll have different instruments that are designed to ask slightly different questions and look in different ways. And anytime you can take two data sets that are taken by different instruments from different points of view with different capabilities and combine them together to query those uh, data sets with with new questions that you can ask once you have this, these combined data, you actually multiply the value of your data set. It doesn't, far from being competitive or reducing the value of your data set, it actually increases it. And um, I think one way to, to emphasize that is to look at how valuable some of the very oldest data sets still are, even at Mars, where we've sent a lot of spacecraft. You know, Viking was um, a mission designed to get photographic uh, orbital photos of the spa- of the whole planet for the first time. And it really did uh, produce a global color data set that is still very valuable for setting up your base maps of the planet. Like every time I make a map that shows all of Mars, where I'm like, here's where all the landing sites are or, or whatever else, it's Viking color that I use for that. One of the very first missions of this renaissance was Mars Global Surveyor. And it took the topographic data set that is literally the base map for every other data set that has ever been produced for Mars. It's going to be decades before somebody comes up with something better than that. And so it's not that, um, you know, new missions, new technology make anything obsolete. No, they multiply the value of of what we're doing. And uh, of course, it depends on there being open sharing between the different countries that are doing this work. But China does have agreements with, um, with ESA um, and with uh, with other with pretty much everybody except the United States, <laughs> and so uh, everybody I think is is going to benefit. I hope um, the orbital mission has a really spectacular camera on it. At least its its capabilities um, as listed are spectacular, and um, it will be good as long as there's data sharing policies in place, um, because the the only other comparable camera is on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which arrived there in 2006. And that's 15 years old. It's way past its warranty. I hope it lasts many more years into the future, but we can't rely on it lasting that much longer. And we'll need those high resolution data sets to follow the progress of our landed missions in the future. What is it uh, about Mars that, that makes it such a fascinating planet as far as we are concerned and one that warrants such such study? Well, I'm going to give a flip answer and then I'll give a more <laughs> serious answer. But the flip answer is that it's easy. Um, in some ways. <laughs> so I have to qualify that because Mars is also the hardest place to land in the solar system. But, um, you know, the moon is the easiest interplanetary body to get to. Uh, it only takes typically a couple day cruise to get there and then you can get into orbit. And it's a good testing ground for where you operate your first um, uh, deep space missions. And both China and India um, in the last decade had their first um, their first lunar missions as a way of testing their deep space communications and deep space navigation. Um, China used their lunar missions to do some uh, pretty amazing things for for their you know being uh, up there for the first time. You know they succeeded on their first lunar landing. They did automated sample return. They played around with interplanetary navigation using these Lagrangian gravity balance points that lets them park in one spot for a while, wait for an asteroid to come by, and then go rendezvous with it. And so. Um, you know, I didn't, ex- I honest, I'll be honest, I didn't expect them to succeed with their first Mars landing because nobody succeeds with their first Mars landing, except I guess the U.S. did and with Viking, but um, but they did. And uh, it's pretty amazing that they did. And it's, uh, it's nice to have that um, record broken of there being only one space agency that has ever successfully landed on Mars. Now there are two. Um, so Mars is relatively easy. It's the next logical place to go after the moon because the navigation is pretty straightforward. Um, It is well mapped. So you understand its gravity field. You know what you need to do to get into orbit. 
You have, you can define very well your questions and how you're going to explore it. You know exactly what kinds of science instruments you need to build. And its geology is very uh, Earth-like. It's not Earth-like in ways that make it fascinating to study, but it is um, accessible in that way so that you can design and test a lot of instruments uh, and techniques on Earth that will work very well on Mars. Venus, uh, by contrast, is closer. Um, It's actually easier to get to navigation-wise, but um, unless you're there to study the atmosphere, Venus is a very difficult planet to do anything with because you can't see through the clouds to the geology on the surface very well. So um, Mars really is the next step, other perhaps than asteroids after the moon. And it's it's definitely a place where um, you kind of need to go to to test your, uh, to challenge your space agency's ability to accomplish things in deep space before you go further to the main belt or to the outer planets to do even more challenging things. What about the um, search for for life or at least for signs of life on Mars? Um, is that is that ultimately where where the sort of at least the uh, robotic observations um, are are sort of uh, amounting to, or is there is there more to it than than the exploration of, of Mars itself? Um, well, sure. So there, I mean, I think you've mentioned both of the main motivations for studying Mars. One is to answer that question about whether, given the same starting conditions, the same physics, the same ingredients, um, the same uh, environment that supports liquid water, did life arise on both Earth and Mars? Because that helps us understand the question of whether life is common in the universe or not. Um, if you believe that if you set up the same kind of experiment twice that you should get the same result, then it would be shocking if life did not originate on Mars, which is, I think, why so many people are, uh, you know, so intent on looking for it there. And so the question is not really about was there life on Mars, although, of course, it would be fabulous to discover it if there was. It's really about is life common in the universe or not? If we find it on Mars, odds are good that it's common. If we can't find it on Mars, despite all our looking, or anywhere else in the solar system, then maybe Earth is is quite a unique place. And so that's one of the motivations, and I think probably the most um, publicly palatable motivation for studying Mars. The other one is um, a bit more um, intellectual, just curiosity about uh, the history of a planet that is so similar to Earth and yet diverged in this way that makes it cold and apparently uh, lifeless, and um, also not just in terms of biological life, but also geologically speaking. Mars is Mars does remain geologically active, but has far less internal energy than Earth does, so it's, it's much more quiescent. Um, but if Mars didn't ever actually have life, then the geology that it has and what it preserves from early in the age of the solar system is kind of a time capsule of what Earth was like before life came to dominate Um, everything about the surface of Earth. You look at everything on Earth, all of the geology even, and even the weather is strongly influenced by life. And so if you can compare and contrast Earth and Mars ancient geology, then you kind of understand what, uh, you you understand all those differences about Earth that make it um, strange because of the prevalence of life here. Yes, and I suppose to to that end, that's that's one of the the other advantages about Mars is the fact that you can actually land on it. Um, I was um, I was wanting to get your thoughts on the on, on you know uh, NASA's latest lander, um, uh, Perseverance, and the uh, Ingenuity helicopter. Um, mm-hmm. What are you sort of looking forward to about about that mission most, and and what ultimately is is, is Perseverance going to be doing? So uh, there's a couple things I look forward to. One is just the road trip. You know, <laughs> I'm an American. I love getting in my car and driving across the countryside and seeing the landscape change and going over this hill and seeing, oh, look at that beautiful cliff and and that uh, that pattern of rocks. It's just I love it. And so that's you know part of uh, of what I like about these rovers so much is just the road trip and seeing the new sites and being able to appreciate Mars in that way. You know, most of the time you land in a spot and that spot is the only place you've seen. Even the Apollo uh, um, missions, um, until they got those super cool dune buggies that they took to the moon, they were really just looking at one spot on the moon. And you can imagine being set down on a random spot on Earth and how much you would learn about our planet if you couldn't drive anywhere. And so um, just the opportunity to go over the hill and see what's on the other side is just really fun. 
With perseverance, it's a, you know, it, it looks superficially similar to curiosity, but the science instruments or the science instrument suite is pretty different in that it has not carried to Mars these powerful analytical labor- laboratories that take samples and um, and determine their mineralogy and, and you know, the, the gases they have trapped in them and everything. Instead, it's storing samples for a future sample mm. return. And Mars sample return is a, a idea that's been around for a long time. Um, after all, we did lunar sample return almost as soon as we landed on the moon. We need to do it for Mars in order to answer a lot of questions that we have about its geologic history, about its chemistry, about whether it can support life in the present or could in the past. Um, but we don't have samples from uh, well-documented places. And that's what Perseverance is designed to do, is to collect those samples and, more importantly, document them so that we know exactly the geologic context that they came from, um, you know, what the setting was, how old they were relative to other rocks on Mars, and then uh, being able to bring those back and send them into hundreds of laboratories around the world is just so much better than being able to plug samples into two miniaturized instruments that are on a very power-limited rover. And so Perseverance's uh, main accomplishments will probably not really be um, achieved until long after the rover is dead. Um, and uh, recently, in the last year or two, we've really gotten a good vision of how NASA and ESA are going to collaborate to make that that sample return vision come true. So I am looking forward to that. It's going to be immensely challenging. It requires some really cool technology, like you know, launching a rocket from the surface <laughs> of Mars. That's going to be really fun. Landing a rover. It's going to be a European built rover that will. Um, follow in Perseverance's footsteps and go on this, like, you know, treasure hunt. Uh, it's going to be what it, geocaching, basically. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to go and find all those little uh, treasures that were left behind by um, Perseverance and bring them back and load them in. It's going to be robots doing amazing things. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think you've really hit the nail on the head there that that these missions are ultimately cool. You know, there, there's, there are something to get yeah. excited about. <laughs> but I think sometimes it does take someone to actually communicate those the sort of coolness of these missions to the public because these are you know like the the design and building and operation of a rover is is highly com- complex um, and that's one of the things I wanted to sort of bring up in with regard to your your book about the the design and engineering of Curiosity was it difficult when you were writing and researching the book to to take the the complexities of 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 a, of a Mars rover and turn that into into a cool story that that you know that that, that people can get excited about and, and understand. Well, it was certainly challenging, but it's the kind of challenge that I live for. So the, the basic idea uh, of what I do is that I take stuff that is written in a language that most people don't understand, and I translate it into a language that they do. And uh, the the rover, the engineering was indeed so, com- it's probably the most complicated thing ever, um, ever to go beyond Earth orbit. Um, it is incredibly complicated. There's no one person who understands how all its parts work. So I had to talk to, you know, dozens of people to each of whom was expert in one part to try to explain how this thing worked. And in fact, this book was not the book that I intended to write when I first, um, agreed to write this book. I intended to write the science one, the the second one, but the science is so dependent on how the rover works that I needed to understand how the rover worked in order Mm -hmm. to be able to write the science book. And so I, uh, after struggling with trying to figure out how this book uh, hung together after a couple of years of work, I realized I had two books and I had to publish this one first before I could get to the science stuff. Um, And yeah, you know, there are systems that are more complicated than I can understand. And I just didn't write about those, to be honest. (laughs) There are so many systems that are actually much easier to understand. Like the rover has a circulatory system. It's got liquid pumping through tubes in its uh, body that take heat from the hot uh, the power supply and pipe it through to help keep the insides warm. And if the rover gets too hot, then it moves that fluid up to the top deck. And so it can fan away its heat. And that's like, it, it's just, it's got two hearts. It's got one main one and a backup one in case the first one, the first pump stops working. Um, I think one of the things that really impressed me when I was uh, gathering pictures for illustrating this book was that every you know, as advanced a piece of technology as a Mars rover is, it is a custom handcrafted object that 
really is built by human hands. And that, that came home to me when I was looking at the pictures sitting on Mars of the rover, the top deck, and you see all these cables snaking across the surface and they're all held down by little knots. So there's, you know, you can see some, you can just imagine somebody in their clean room suit tying knots and knots have to be one of the very oldest human technologies. I mean, birds tie knots, <laughs> right? So, I mean, you're talking about millions of year old technology that is still being used to build a space robot and send it to Mars. And it's still the best solution to the problem is tying little knots and string <laughs> to hold those cable ties down. It's so cool. And one of the things I've sort of come to learn um, through speaking to um, you know, the people involved in, in, in missions and in, in the sort of solar system exploration missions, when, when those missions are, are still being um, planned and they haven't yet been approved, is that you have lots of different um, scientists and teams who are all sort of fighting to get their instrument on the payload. Um, it, is it a bit of a jostle, do you think, sort of, um, uh, sort of having to compromise between the, the weight of the payload and, and the instruments that you can actually ha- have on there? It is a bit of a jostle and the process isn't perfect, but they do their best to make it as transparent as possible. So they say um, when it's time for uh, their missions are operated uh, or planned in slightly different ways. This mission uh, was a flagship mission, which means that um, NASA announced, hey, we have this big boat we're about to launch. (laughs) We have this much cargo space. Um, and we can keep, we can carry this many um, scientists passengers, and so you should propose for how many scientists and how much of the cargo you want to take up with your experiment, and convince us that your experiment is worth the amount of space we have on our boat. It's um, it's really quite the same as like any you know uh, uh, of those ex- exploration cruises, or that you know like the one that Darwin went on. <laughs> or, um, and you often have uh, similar um, uh, requirements. Like, for instance, there are cameras on this rover that are scientific cameras. They're designed for scientific purposes to try to figure out rock compositions and do other things. But they're also required to take survey images to help the rover navigate. It's kind of like bringing a painter along your exploration <laughs> journey, whose re- responsibility was to document the trip. But also, they were, you know, doing their research and cataloging new species and everything along the way. It's the, it's really the same. It's it's following in the footsteps of uh, explorers from, uh, you know, centuries for centuries and centuries, um, and so it's uh, you have to put together a team that convincingly can accomplish the uh, the scientific goal that you set, and you're required to fit within these cargo limits in terms of mass um, and also power requirements, and can your instruments survive the temperatures and the stresses of being launched and landed? That's actually usually one of the, the most difficult things. It's not the, the operations, it's the stress of the launch, the landing, and the, um, the temperature swings from day to night on Mars that are the most challenging things to meet, because you're talking about these state-of-the-art delicate instruments, and then you are subjecting them to 5Gs and launching them on top an enormous shaky rocket. They do shake a lot. And then you're swinging them, you know, daytime temperatures can get as high as like 10 degrees Celsius sometimes. And nighttime temperatures get as low as like minus 90. So, and that happens every day. And your instrument has to be able to survive a certain level of that. So those things are, they're difficult. And NASA makes choices in that they're about the quality of the team. They're about the, um, the way that all the science can hang together as one scientific package. And they're also about whether they believe that people can deliver on their promises in terms of producing an instrument that is capable of surviving these conditions to produce the good science. And often uh, when there are delays, it's because people uh, turn out not to be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you think ultimately that the uh, best way of, of actually really getting down and understanding a planet like Mars w- would be to get Human, humans on the planet. I mean, can you imagine if you if you were able to have a geologist and a biologist and a, and a, and a chemist actually living on Mars and doing doing the work there? Or, or do you think that the uh, rovers do do a pretty good job? <laughs> I have a sort of a compromise view on this. So there is really no replacement for human brain and dexterity yet. Um, presumably, uh, at some point, technology will get there, but we're a long way from that for now. However, um, robots can survive in environments that we can't. They have endurance that we don't. Um, And 
what it takes to have a human survive and live in uh, in space is um, is profound. Like we have not accomplished yet what we need to in order to have humans survive a long duration space flight out and back from Earth, much less land on another world and take off again. It's that takeoff is actually even harder. Um, plus the sort of long term survival on the surface. So there's there's a lot of things that. Um, I believe we'll be able to do someday, but we are a long way from solving those problems. What we are getting incredibly good at is using robotic uh, avatars uh, to do things in environments that are too dangerous for humans. So whether you're talking about um, distance um, operating theaters where you have a surgeon in a safe place operating um, you know, a, a robotic uh, surgery tool somewhere across the country or across the world, or whether you have people teleoperating, um, you know, robots that are often developed with JPL robotic technology that go into um, earthquake zones and look for um, survivors and all those kinds of things. Places that would be too dangerous for humans, yet you're still using the human brain and dexterity. I think that that is really the path forward for most deep space exploration. And you keep the human, the squishy, <laughs> delicate human bodies that require such a finely tuned environment and a constant supply of water and food and all of these other things, you keep them in a very carefully safe environment, shielded from radiation, all of the things you need to do to keep people safe. But you, um, you know, teleoperate, you send their brains, their brain power and their dexterity through, but through uh, virtual reality, through teleoperation of much hardier robots on the surface that then you can abandon them on the surface. You don't have to worry about bringing them back up off the surface. And as a bonus, which I don't think is a bonus at all, um, but not everybody agrees, but as a bonus, you can also sterilize those machines before you send them down to Mars. So you're not risking contaminating the Martian environment with Earth microbes before we've had a chance to discover whether life is actually does exist on Mars or not. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose... Um... Those sort of uh, avatars that you talk about might, might be might be good for, you know, exploring a really really hostile planet like Venus. Absolutely, uh, Venus um, good for say working in the microgravity environment around an asteroid. Um, you know, basically exploring anywhere. And I think that things are getting so real now. I mean, we're we're actually this is technology that is easy to imagine. Like we're already doing it. The fact that we can do remote surgery, microsurgery, <laughs> is just it's still it's I. I kind of don't believe it, even <laughs> though I know that it works. Um, it, it's just, it's really mind boggling what you can do. And that is, you know, being a surgeon is, it's one of those things that you joke about, you know, it's not brain surgery, right? It's, <laughs> and yet we do brain surgery telerobotically now. And so it seems to me that Martian exploration telerobotically is no stretch whatsoever. So yeah, um, absolutely. This way you could develop, um, you know, a ship, uh, an environment uh, a way to keep the humans safe that you don't have to modify for every different place you go. You just build the robots for the different places. And we already know how to build robots for different places. Hmm. So we're, we're close to that, that capability already. The long-term deep space survival is still a, a problem we have to solve though. Yeah. I mean, it, just to sort of come back to the, what we we're talking, um, you know, the, 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 search, the search for signs of life on Mars. Um, it, it's sort of interesting to, to look at those other bodies in the solar system where signs of life might exist, or at least the sort of um, hospitable conditions exist. Um, where do you, do you think that those those conditions most are in the solar system? And um, you know, what are your sort of hopes for the for future solar system uh, exploration if this if this golden age is is to continue? Well, um, I think that uh, <laughs> life finds a way, right? <laughs> so um, there are. You know, there are places where it's certainly more likely for life to have originated than others. You need the basic ingredients of um, a solvent, probably water. We don't really understand how you could, um, the chemistry that would allow um, uh, complex life chemistry in other solvents like methane or, I don't know, liquid hydrogen. But um, so right now we're just looking at water because that's less exotic. You need water, you need uh, the raw materials of carbon and other, um, those lighter elements, which it turns out are much more common in the outer solar system than they are in the inner solar system, because those are all volatile materials that were kind of burned away, um, you know, sent out by the hot, by the, by the young sun. 
And so Earth is actually relatively poor in this kind of material, as is Mars, but you've got a lot of it in all those icy moons in the outer solar system. Um, and you need, uh, you need a place where you have a, a source of energy, and that can be solar energy, it can be thermal energy, and you need all of those things to exist in combination um, stably for a long time and to be protected from the harsh uh, environment of deep space and radiation. And so a couple of the top places for that are um, Enceladus and Europa, because both of those are worlds that have a terrestrial style geology. So they are mostly rocky worlds with active geology underneath. And then right above the rock, the hot rock where there's you know eruptions and things happening, you have an ocean, a saltwater, a briny ocean. And so those are the kinds of conditions that you can imagine where you can get complicated chemistry happening by accident. And perhaps if that is what is required in order for life to begin, um, you, can, you can foresee that actually happening. And there has been some really interesting research that says that actually it's not enough to have uh, these organic, rich, salty brines. You actually have to dry things out so that you concentrate those organic materials. So a place that's more like a hot spring where you have um, much more rock than water, and occasionally you run out of water and things get, get concentrated like that, it may actually be a better place to start this life chemistry, which could explain why Earth was a better place to get it started, and maybe then Mars too. Um, but Enceladus and Europa still seem like two good places to look. And I'm just fascinated by Titan, because you know it has not only liquid water ocean underneath its surface, but it does have this methane-ethane brew in complex organic materials just raining down from the atmosphere. And so um, I don't know what's going on down there, but I would really love to check out the chemistry. And fortunately, there is a mission being designed and built to go explore that in the future. It's called Dragonfly, and it's a it's actually a quadcopter, um, but it's not a teeny one like Ingenuity. It's, its body is actually based on the same power source and design as this rover right here. It's got the same power supply. It is a big machine that they're going to be sending to explore Titan. That's going to be really cool. That's awesome. I mean, can you imagine, just go back to your uh, uh, avatar idea, if you could actually sort of through virtual reality swim through the subsurface oceans of uh, Enceladus? <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Yeah, it was, I'm, I know it's, uh, I mean, there's been so much space art about that and you see all these like various leviathans you know, lurking in the depths. <laughs> You know, Europa has whales, and I forget what Enceladus has. <laughs> it doesn't actually have whales, but we like to joke about, you know, all the, the kraken and other things that may be down there uh, just waiting for unsuspecting explorers to come and disturb their environment. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I think I think whatever we find, I mean, you know, the next the next few years, few decades are, are, are bound to, you know, um, present some absolutely fascinating results and I'm, I'm looking forward to them as I'm, I'm sure you are uh, Emily but just want to say uh, you know thanks for thanks for coming on the podcast today and, and, and sharing your, your knowledge and expertise with us you're very welcome as you can tell I enjoy talking about this stuff <laughs>